everybody. Welcome to Short Film Saturday. We are going at it again. We have another amazing filmmaker joining us today, and I am so, so excited to show these films to you. My name is Nase DeSanders. I'm the Community Growth Manager here at Soleil Space. First, let me tell you a little bit about Soleil. Our mission is to achieve a more equitable and representative global media landscape through film, television, and branded content. Our focus is on the global diasporas of Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, and the Middle East, with goals of elevating those untold stories from these cultures, forming closer transcultural community bonds, and providing opportunities and resources for our creators to produce premium world-class content. We specialize in long-form scripted and documentary film, television, and branded short-form digital content. We aim to uplift underrepresented voices, and there is no better way to do that than with short films. Shorts are often the purest form of artistic expression and often, but not always, Ways, executed within the boundaries of smaller production budgets. Since launching Short Film Saturdays in late summer of 2021, we have featured 55 films from 45 filmmakers in 22 countries to date. That is a lot. And today we are just adding to those numbers with our wonderful guest, Daniel Fermin Pfeffer. So let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a Mexican-American screenwriter, director, and producer from Ithaca, New York. He attended Brooklyn College and NYU Tisch School of the Arts for film and TV production. After earning his BFA, he went on to work in the film industry under various capacities. Daniel strives to use captivating narrative by creating socially conscious films which speak to the human condition and to audiences worldwide. He is an MFA candidate and teaching fellow in screenwriting and directing at the graduate film program at Columbia University School of the Arts and in 2017 Daniel was the proud recipient of the Denver Film Festival Liberty Global Domestic Student Filmmaker Award. So let's have a big round of applause for Daniel. Daniel can you please tell us a little bit about the two films of yours that we're going to be watching today? Uh, absolutely. So my name, again, is Daniel Fermin Pfeffer. And again, I'm just so happy to be in this space with you. Uh, <clears throat> the first short that you guys are going to screen is While I Was Gone, which was uh, all filmed and produced in Ithaca, New York, where I grew up and stars one of my best friends from childhood, Lucas Monroe. Uh, prior to that, he had no acting experience. So it's very much a docudrama hybrid. Uh, we have one actor in there that I use in a lot of my films, Joshua Rivera. Uh, from Queens, New York. Uh, but everyone else in, in the short is from Ithaca. Um, it's totally a homegrown film. And it's also uh, partially Lucas's own story, um, dramatized on screen. Uh, and then the other short that we have is Alta Gracia. Uh, and that was my first film at Columbia University. Uh, it's a special short about a Latino family in Manhattan and uptown and sort of about the moment, the day that uh, a first gen college student returns home to her strict traditional family and sort of the alienation she feels, as well as keeping a, a secret that leads to family drama. Uh, again, we were using this to sort of de debunk stereotypes about what a Latino family might look and sound like um, coming from an urban urban environment. And again, I use very special actors that I that I keep returning to. Yanisi Noah and Joshua Rivera are also in it, as well as the great Yvette Mercedes. Um, so that's a, a, also a, a film that is close to the heart. Wonderful. We are so, so excited to watch these films. So I'm going to give a little run of show. What we're doing today is right after this, we're going to go in and watch those films and then do not go anywhere because we're having a Q&A afterwards. We're going to dive into those amazing films and get to the nitty gritty. We're going to talk all about it. And then if you have your own questions, you guys can submit them uh, in the comment section below because we are going to have audience questions at the very end. So don't go anywhere. OK, don't forget to like and subscribe. You know, this is YouTube. We got to say it. And with that, let's enjoy those films. Thank you so much. So this is Short Film Saturday for those of you who might have joined us mid in the films. My name is Nancy DeSanders and I'm here with Daniel Fermin Pfeffer. And we're going to start talking about While I Was Gone because that's the first one we watched. So let's dive right in. Daniel, While I Was Gone is a docudrama you made about and with a close friend who you grew up with in Ithaca, New York. So what made you want to recreate Friend's story? Well, actually, it's it's a funny it's a funny story, or it's an interesting one. Uh, 
it started with Lucas reaching out to me. He wanted to write a memoir about his life. And we had lost contact for a little bit, where, you know, uh, after high school and all that. But we stayed obviously in touch through Facebook and, you know, had always uh, had love for each other since we were little kids. Um, and he reached out to me. I was uh, at the time at Columbia University getting my MFA in screenwriting and directing. And I was <clears throat> deep in the trenches of making short films, one after the other, sometimes two a year, but at least one a year at that point. And uh, as well as like working on tons of other people's projects and all this stuff. But he he reached out to me and asked for help to, to maybe write a book about his life. And I was like, well, I have no idea how to write a, <laughs> a memoir, Luke, but I am making films and maybe we could collaborate on something. Uh, Lucas was always a really special character in, uh, growing up. He was a basketball star. He had a lot of um, street cred in, in a lot of ways and just, you know, just an interesting guy. And I knew a little bit about his family and, and stuff. So I said, maybe there's a, a story we could make. I got to make a short anyways for Columbia. So maybe there's a chance. So the first thing we did was a screen test and he was cool with that idea. He was like, okay, yeah, that sounds really interesting actually. So he came up to New York city, he came down to New York city from Ithaca and we did a, a couple screen tests with like um, directing actor sort of exercises just on like a DSLR camera. And he just nailed it. I mean, every time he got in front of the camera, he was so natural um, just being himself, nuanced, already could understand, kind of already naturally understood how to move for the camera, which is something um, I'm always stressing to my students, you know, like um, uh, theater is performing, film is being. That's my main note. And he was just good at being and good at doing like subtle little moves left and right, you know, gazes and like pauses, just kind of natural and never overacting. I was like this you're incredible. And so that's that's basically how we embarked on the first part of our creative journey, which led us to then a feature film called I'll See You Around. And then there's it's a trilogy. And then there's a third installment called Hold That Weight, which is now um, part of a, a bigger exhibition at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. Um, it's projected playing on a projector uh, repeatedly right now in, in San Francisco, our third. And it's a music video. Um, commissioned by Samora Pinder Hughes, who's a musician and artist based in between Berkeley and um, New York City. No, that's very cool though. So then what was the onset collaboration process like with your friend? Well, at first, so after the screen test, we still didn't really have a story. And so it started with, the seed of the story was gonna be more of like, um, I don't know, like a dark comedy about a, like an obsessed filmmaker trying to make a film about his childhood friend and sort of like the exploitative process of filmmaking. And we were kind of exploring that. But then as we were doing that, like some real stuff was going down with Luke and he mentioned it. He actually didn't even mention it to me. He was ranting, up, you know, writing some posting about it in on Facebook. He was upset about something and it was the story that you see. Um, and so then for me, I had to take a pause. I called him and I said, Luke, if that really happened to you, maybe that's the story. Um, cause I see, you know, I knew his brother Kenji in real life and, and, uh, his mother Darlene and, and I said, you know, there's an interesting portrait of you a day, a day in the life of you searching for, for Kenji. And he said, you know, you might be right. So I took a stab at the script. It was it was like literally a six page script. So it's very um, skeletal. There is not a lot of dialogue in it. It's just like imagery and sort of following him around. And then a lot of the stuff you're seeing is, I wouldn't say it's all improv, but a lot of it's improv, including the, the conversation between Darlene and Lucas at the dinner table um, midday. Um, that's, that's just him and his mom riffing. Okay. So then that leads perfectly into my next question about your use of non-actors for this project. How did you manage to elicit such natural performances from the actors, especially during the improvised scenes? I would imagine those ones might be more difficult with non-actors, but you, but you tell me. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's funny since I was at 
Tisch School of the Arts at New York University back in, started that in 2006, graduated in 2009. Uh, I've always been sort of interested in non-actors to a degree. I think a lot of the films I grew up seeing that really like hit home to me were more like realist films from 70s and 90s more, more or less, and um, maybe some in the early 2000s, like Raising Victor Vargas and just films that, you know, that had really touched me oftentimes uh, were, were these realist films. So I had started that journey with non-actors back in college. And then uh, I kind of let go of that for a little while and I started casting more professional actors. And then I went full circle in grad school and came back. So there was a lot of practice leading up to while I was gone. So that didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, and then it also really helped that Lucas and his mother and his brother were all just supernaturals. Like I, I lucked out and it doesn't, we actually tried to use, like when we did the feature, we tried to have more non-actors that weren't maybe related to them, but they could be characters in the world that we were making. And uh, some of that landed flat on his face. We had to cut the scenes out because it just didn't match up to the naturalist sort of way that his his nucleus of his family were were so I don't know just so inclined to perform for the camera and in these like natural ways is so it can definitely backfire on you um so I think it's a combination of doing working on it failing at it earlier on in my life coming back to it understanding more about the process of of the craft of directing and and all that and then just lucky getting lucky with Lucas and and his and his family. That's really I, I don't oh, know how cool. it because it, like I said, it doesn't you can't even if even as a seasoned director, you can't rely on that always. I mean, there's some people that yeah. just literally either they freeze up or they overact and, and then you can't bring it in like if you bring it down, then they get stiff and then so you know it's not. It's not a, a cookie cutter formula by any means. Yeah. Okay. So then I want to take it back to this trilogy. Was it always meant to be a trilogy? And then also for those who don't know about it, can you explain the concept of this uh, While I Was Gone trilogy to us, please? It was never meant to be a trilogy. In fact, we did the short film and while I was gone, ended up playing quite well in the festival circuit. And I still had to make a thesis to graduate from Columbia. And uh, we actually thought of the second, so with the success of the short, um, we immediately thought, well, maybe, maybe it's time to make this into a feature. And that wasn't really my initial plan at all. Uh, I also figured just to be transparent, um, I don't know, I just, I didn't want to rely on going into like uh, the Sundance labs or something or playing that kind of game where I was going to, uh, I guess, wait around a, a while and, and have to get the private equity and get the lab supports from these different things. And I was like never quite landing those anyway. So then I thought, well, while I'm in grad school, we could do like um, a we were thinking like a web series, but a mini web series at first that would be like of that this would be the second part of the film series. And we want to do like, well, there's never been a web series made with like HBO almost quality sort of filmmaking. Um, so that was the original. And it was like the script was written in chapters. So each, each chapter was like an episode or like a short film almost of its own exploring a relationship in Lucas's life. And we were going to further dramatize it. So I was, I was taking more liberty in the dramatization. Whereas like while I was gone, I, is obviously very, um, it's based on reality, but it's still, and it's still, it, it's fiction in the sense of the way we uh, approach the narrative, right? It has style to it. It's not, it's not a documentary by any means, but it was based more on real things. The feature then took a little more liberty. So it has characters that aren't really a part of the world that we kind of brought in, um, including a therapist played by the great Roger Guinevere Smith. Um, uh, a woman he has an affair with played by Maria Wilson, who kind of wakes him up to what, how he needs to change in the feature. Um, so that, so the feature kind of came along with like, um, 
it originally maybe being this like mini web limited web series of HBO quality sort of filmmaking that then turned into a feature just due to the length and just being like, well, what's the, you know, who's going to watch this and where, where can we, uh, where can it live the longest, you know? Then after the feature, uh, time went by and Samora Penderhughes really uh, <clears throat> brought in the idea of making a third part to the to the creative journey between Lucas and I. And um, that's where the music video Hold That Weight came from. So that's how it became three parts. But originally it was just while I was gone and it was just um, a cathartic experience for both of us because we both come from Ithaca. We both grew up together. So we knew a lot about each other. So collaborating there was was really beautiful. and. Um, I remember too, a, a close friend of ours had gone in a car accident and passed away and we had, that we had been uh, childhood friends with and, and, you know, we dedicated the film to that rest in peace, Larry Chap, and we bonded a little bit over that. And then, you know, we kept building. And so that's where that came from, but it was the success of the short that then brought us to the feature and then, and then later on to the, to the music video. So it was a, quite a process. And it was not, you know, very it was nice. not planned. Okay, very nice. Well, it certainly has come together well, and I'm sure audience members are excited to see the other two parts. So getting back to while I was gone, I'm taking this from your director's statement. You said, after the short was completed, we realized how much it resonates with the urgent issues underlying the Black Lives Matter movement. So what issues did you feel it touched upon and how did Black American audiences react to this film? Well, I can't speak for everyone um, and I certainly can't really speak for Black American audiences. Uh, I can't really speak for any audience member, but I can say what we wanted to do. For us, it was just a way to... Um, humanize Lucas's experiences in Ithaca kind of as we were going into our, our second coming of age, which was sort of like, we like to call like um, turning 30 and sort of what, what that meant for, for us. Um, as far as the Black Lives Matter movement, I think it just is uh, an opportunity again to show the true internal life of um, someone's particular struggle and in a college town that is predominantly white for so many uh, generations. And uh, it's an Ivy League college town where Cornell University is. So I think a story like this is not something people necessarily pair with an idyllic college town. And it's an, and it's an opportunity to, to showcase that. And and to humanize that and to, again, debunk stereotypes and show people's internal struggles in a really, really honest way. Like, cause obviously while I was gone is like not, not necessarily engineered or made or crafted for the main, for like mainstream necessarily. It has entertaining elements to it, but at the end of the day, it was meant as a work of art part of my Columbia MFA screenwriting directing program. So there was no, we're not pandering to any audience, anyone in particular. And I wouldn't, I don't even know if we're, it's not just for black audiences. It's for the universe really, you know? Very nice. So with that, let's hop over to Alta Gracia and talk about that a little bit. What was the initial inspiration for you to make Alta Gracia? So Alta Gracia um, to me is just this beautiful personal piece that I was, um, I think the initial um, idea of it came from, I, was, I had been living in Harlem on and off for many years. I was kind of always in between Brooklyn and Harlem, uh, depending on the year, depending on uh, where I was financially or whatever the case may be, or where I was as an artist. So I was always... Um, I was always in, in Harlem in, one, in, in some shape or form. And I remember I was going to a church, um, a Latino, kind of a pan Latino church that I really loved the, the music that was playing there and sort of all the different 
Latino uh, people coming together as a community. You could tell some were from Central America, South America, the Caribbean. And this particular church, it's over on Convent Avenue. And it had, I wish I remember, I think it was called uh, Iglesia de Anunciación, something like that. And it was just, this particular church just played beautiful, beautiful music. And that's, I think, where the first, uh, where the where the first idea first came about was going to that church, thinking about it. And then just thinking about, you know, uh, people I'd met along, you know, along the way in my life, um, stemming back all the way from like my first girlfriend in middle school, you know, and um, she was Puerto Rican from the Bronx. And, you know, that's probably where, where some of that came from. And then I just started molding the story. I started thinking like, oh my God, this is an opportunity. I wanted to work with Josh Rivera and Yanisi Noah again, because I had done a short years before called Milk and Honey, but I wanted to do something that was going to like, again, debunk stereotypes, that was going to humanize people, that was going to br- approach things intelligently and thoughtfully and um, kind of go against, I guess, how, you know, I don't, I, I, the problem with the, like a lot of our domestic Latino cinema is that we're still at a stage where we all have to act super Latino and we can't just have a story that happens to be Latinx, right? So it's yeah. that's that's kind of where that was coming from, and and I wanted to portray it in a way where it's like, yes, they're super Latino, but they're not they're not um, it's not in the heights. It's not trying. We're not trying to like um, jump up and down for you. We're going to just show you a slice of life that's that's beautiful and thoughtful and authentic. Very nice. So you've already touched upon my second question a little bit. But in Alta Gracia, I understand it was important to you to push against these media stereotypes of the Latino family. So I want to kind of get into how you went about doing that in Alta Gracia. So I asked this question to give better context for viewers who may not live in the United States and may not know what stereotypical betrayals that we're used to seeing, because maybe they're seeing completely different stereotypical betrayals or no betrayals at all. So if you please just let us know what you were specifically pushing against and how that gets to be subverted in Alta Gracia. <laughs> okay, yeah. So when talking about Alta Gracia and um, debunking stereotypes, I was going to say, ironically, I was actually trying to go against some of my own earlier works, my own short films, where I kind of realized I was stereotyping my own community, my own my own being, um, just because, like I said, our, even our condition has been conditioned in the United States which I think a lot of maybe international people sometimes don't realize how how bad it is here. I think Americans love to categorize ourselves and put each other in boxes. And oh, yeah. um, and so, you know, it's and, and we ended up doing it to ourselves, you know. So that was kind of like I was like, I want to make something that's not violent. I want to make something that um, maybe isn't filled with maybe it's in an urban environment, but it's not filled with slang that you would think comes with that environment um wanted to show a nerdy latino brother who has maybe a little bit of asperger's and is trying to figure out his place in the world alongside his sister who's now going to be a first generation college student and sort of what does that look like what does that feel like and um and how can we make something dramatic that isn't over the top and 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 that, that's how Alta Gracia was born. Very nice. Sure. So just talking about the presence of Christianity and what that presence of religion looks like in the average American household, Mexican American household, and how does that compare to what we we just saw in Alta Gracia as well? Sure. I mean, again, I can in your own say- opinion, of course. You haven't yeah, been in every American household. Is- Sure, sure, because America is obviously a melting pot and, and a hodgepodge of, of different cultures. But uh, hmm. I didn't grow up religious, and uh, but my mother is born and raised in Mexico, in La Ciudad de Puebla. And um, so obviously there is Catholic uh, identity running in my bloodstream, whether I like it or not. And, um, you know, she still was religious in the sense of the iconography and maybe some of the traditions, but we were not a family that was going to church. 
Uh, my father is white American. He's agnostic. My sister's a my older sister's atheist, and my mother was probably the only religious one. But again, not not in the not in that naive sense uh, by any means. Not not in the traditional sense. Um, she was just kind of still practicing traditions and, and ho holding on to some of those things, and you know, kind of creating como nacimientos during during Christmas holiday and Easter and stuff like that. But, um, so I got some of that, um, in Alta Gracia, like I said, I think I was, um, probably portraying things I had seen glimpses of growing up in different households. I mean, uh, Alta Gracia was shot in Washington Heights, but the actors, only one is Dominican, the other two are Puerto Rican. And mm -hmm. uh, Joshua, I, I don't believe he really speaks Spanish. Yanis does, and, and so does Yvette. But um, I was, I guess when I made it, it's sort of uh, pan-Caribbean Latino. It's not trying to be too specific about that, mm -hmm. uh, as, as well as the, the religion as well. Um, so how did I, I guess it was from, like I said, a lot of that came from going to that church all the time and feeling so spiritually moved and kind of taking that. And then obviously seeing households over, over the years of other uh, Caribbean Latino friends. You know, when I first moved to New York City, I stayed with um, my one of my dear friends, Edgar Gomez in, in Woodside, Queens, when I was like, went homeless for a month and he, his family housed me there. And so he's Dominican and I was seeing some of that too. And reminded me of, you know, some of the Puerto Rican households I'd grown up um, going to and stuff. So uh, that's kind of where that came from. Because I, when I, growing up in Ithaca, New York, there was not a lot of Latinos. And the Latinos that were in Ithaca at the time, we're talking late 90s, early 2000s, for the most part, were Puerto Rican folk or some Dominican folk that had moved from New York City to upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, the, there was no Mexican community. You know, the Mexican I knew was my own family, my mother. That's where that came from. Yeah. Mm, okay, very interesting. So then I want to ask you a few questions about yourself as a filmmaker and about, of course, both films as well. So both the films that we saw today deal with kind of troubled familial relationships. Why do you feel this is a theme that you gravitate towards in your work? That's such a great question. and. Um, I don't think anyone's quite asked me that in that way. Um, I think it just comes, to be honest, I think I'm just comes naturally to me. I think I've always been sort of fascinated maybe with family ties and what it means to be family and stuff like that. Uh, I grew up in a, in a quite a nice household. Uh, so I didn't have a, a lot of the maybe complexities and, and conflicts that I'm portraying. Uh, but that's not true either, because it's not like um, you get along. It's not like I got along with my parents all the way growing up. So, I mean, you have you have generational conflicts, you have identity issues, especially if you're uh, multicultural mixed race like me. And so, like, you know, that's that has its own things as well. Um, and perhaps maybe that's where it comes from in a way is like, trying to understand um, tradition versus the new school. And uh, yeah, just like generational conflicts and, and wanting to explore that, you know? Very nice, cool, cool, cool. So then also going back to both films, they both seem to involve the local communities in different ways whether it be the local non-actors like we spoke about, childhood friends, or involving students that you uh, may teach and work with, do you find where you live and the communities you find yourself a part of to have a major influence in your work? I would say I'm most inspired usually by my environment, um, especially over the years. I mean, now I'm, I am writing a little bit more in genre to be able to sell. But I think the films I, like, again, the films that I really love, like La Ciudad by David Riker, Raising Victor Vargas by Peter Soleil, um, um, films like that, um, you know, are done, are inspired by the community first and by characters in the community, real ones, and then 
how can we portray that in an honest light while also dramatizing and engaging audiences? So for me, it's a lot of it has to do with environment. I'm not necessarily drawn to fantasy, um, you know, upfront, more, more realism and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, the environment plays a lot. That's why I love being in New York City versus a, like a lot of other places in the world, because I get a little um, taste of, of everything, right? It's not just mm. one thing ever. And um, different neighborhoods have different vibes, different communities have different vibes. And you start understanding different, you know, it's not just about Latino, it's not just about Black, it's like there's everything in between in New York. And I think I really gravitate yeah. towards that as a multicultural citizen. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, environment plays a huge part of where I'm inspired. And I even take that everywhere I travel, right? I'm always thinking like, what, what, you know, what about this environment could be an interesting, where could there be an interesting story in this environment? Or, you know, the little glimpses of people's interactions, like, yeah. start daydreaming where that could go you know stuff like that very nice and you're living in new york city now yeah i'm based in um bed brooklyn and uh but i also teach at cornell university now as a visiting assistant yeah. professor in screenwriting and film production there and so i'm kind of back and forth ironically ended up back in ithaca for a little bit um yeah but i i come i'm back and forth yeah and okay. I also I teach at NYU too in the summer, so it's you know I get best of both worlds, I guess. Oh, definitely. So let's talk about that a bit. As a film professor, what advice do you have for viewers who might want to study film? Who? Uh, I think it's. I think going to a good, a great film school helps, but I think in this environment right now, it's. I still want to you know, stay true to my philosophy that it's never where you go, but what you do. So just because you go to NYU doesn't mean you're going to have a ticket to success. Just because you go to USC does not mean you have a ticket to success. You could go to a lesser known school and still make really great work. I think what's, I think what's really uh, interesting about right now is that everyone can kind of get their hands on a pretty decent camera and, that's huge. Like even when I was started off in film school, you still kind of needed to shoot on like super 16 millimeter to look professional. And I kind of was at the cusp of when that changed in 2008 and 2009, when the red camera first dropped and then the DSLR revolution happened. And all of a sudden the, the market was saturated with media. But I will say that that wasn't always uh, the case right before. So what's cool now is like, don't let anything stop you. I think like you could make a short film on your cell phone right now, literally um, to start. Uh, I guess that would be my best advice is pick up a camera, learn sound with like a zoom recorder, uh, get some friends and go make a film. And um, I guess with film schools, you just got to know what your intention is. You know, are you going there because you want to make films? Or are you going there because um, you feel directionless and maybe art school is a place where you could find yourself though. Then I would say maybe, maybe that's not a good idea because it's expensive. So I think like a lot of it has to do with your intention. And I always say that even uh, intention is so important, whether it's with your story or whether it's um, with how you're living your life. Right. So I would say it's never where you go, but what you do um, make friends with nerds who can help you along the way, who can really get you going. Um, because you're going to need, you're going to need a lot of help and um, it's all about collaboration. So. All right. That was some killer advice. That was fantastic. So with that, I would like to open the floor to audience questions. You guys can submit your questions in the comment section now, and I'll pick a few to read out while we are giving them some time to type Daniel. I would like to know what is next for you? What projects should we be looking out for? Well, I recently um, produced a pilot under my company banner, One Love Picture Classics, called Cheeky. And I did that with uh, my close collaborators, Carlos Cardona, Sofia Devon, and Rand Rosenberg. We're a ragtag team in Brooklyn. And uh, Cheeky uh, premiered at Sundance Film Festival this year, 2022. Uh, we screened at Los Angeles Latino International, um, Atlanta Film Festival, Series Fest, a bunch of other ones. Uh, we've been winning some awards, so we're trying to get that picked up for series and kind of 
we're still actually mold. We're continuing. We have a good package, but we're continuing to mold it and pitch it to places. Um, so that's one of the main projects. Uh, I have a screenplay called Brujeria that I'm really, really excited about. That's about a Mexican American teenage girl in uh, upstate New York in 1991. And, uh, sort of follows her when she unveils this sort of satanic neo-Nazi cult preying on her family and her community that's uh, very small and burgeoning at the time. So it's kind of like girl with the dragon tattoo meets winter's bone uh, shot like no country for old men, kind of the Mexican Nancy Drew we never had. So that's, that one's exciting. Um, writing a couple other, other scripts as well. I love all the descriptors for that for that script that you just pitched just now. That was awesome. That sounds very cool. <laughs> so we will be looking out for Cheeky. How can audiences keep up with you so that we know when Cheeky comes out? So we know when your script gets optioned or picked up. How do is it best via your website, via Instagram? How should we keep I gotta, up? I gotta update the website, but that one love picture classics.com is a good one to just go to, even though it needs to be updated. Instagram, Danny Pfeffer957, IMDB. Usually my projects will be up there, the ones coming. Great. And then there's obviously Vimeo.com slash OLPC. And that's where you can see usually like at, at the very least teasers of, of any work that I have going on. So those are good. Okay, good perfect. Perfect. Well, All right. So the viewers got to get up. up. What's awesome. That? So we, oh, sorry. We keep talking at the same time. No, no, no. <laughs> so we've got some audience questions in. So let's go ahead and read some of those. We have one from lovely Mika. How does your experience being biracial in the U.S. inform the stories you are telling? Um, I guess for me, it allows me to see, I, I kind of grew up in between two worlds always. I, I never really belonged anywhere. So I'm actually able to see multiple perspectives and um, I'm very much not one-sided. So I, you know, I have a white father, I have a Mexican mother. I, I have friends that are from all walks of life. And I think that really informs my perspective and my art and I can see both sides of the coin always um, and sometimes relate to both sides. You know, sometimes it's not, my life's not black and white. My life's gray. And I think most people's are, uh, even though America tries to make it black and white, but this is a very gray world and, um, and complex and layered. And so that for me, you know, having that multicultural perspective is, is huge. Uh, toward my art and my and my mission, you know, I don't I don't really consider myself and I'm not an activist by any means, and I have no interest in really being an activist. But I think my films, without intending to be, are, are have some activism in them, right? So I'm I'm not much for a message. I really like to follow a character and and dramatize this character's struggles without, and the message comes after, right? The for me, it's really about the, still about the hero's journey. Very nice. So then we have a question from Caroline. What event or thing helped you realize to break the cycle of not perpetuating the same stories that your communities uh, was being told? Uh, say that again. So what, what's, what made me do that? So you'd mentioned earlier, um, oh. That in Alta Grasa, you're going against stereotypes and even against some of the own that you and you, you know, in your earlier journey might have been telling. So was there any specific impetus or event that made you realize, oh my gosh, I gotta do something different? Well, I think I'll be transparent here. So it's not, so it doesn't seem like I'm altruistic or like, you know, walking on water here by any means. I think. I made a film that was a little bloated and a little violent and had problematic things in it that were not necessarily, I don't know. I felt when I look back at it, I was like, there's elements of it that are really good and, and have some authenticity to it. But at the same time, how am I really pushing um, our narrative in a, in a real way? because it was inspired by people I knew growing up 
I was like, why did I make it into this like kind of violent borderline, like thriller action film at the end um, when I should have just made a portrait about this young girl in a college town, this young Puerto Rican girl in a college town and sort of made this beautiful like portrait piece like I did for while I was gone. So the reception, I think, of this film, Milk and Honey, made me question my, my artistic mission, I think, and, and made me reevaluate the way I was going to approach, approach my art moving, moving forward. And that, so it was that turning point where, you know, I didn't get into the top festivals that I wanted to and all these things. And I was like, but why, why? And then I like kind of looked back at it. And I was like, well, because you were kind of making something trite. And that's not, and that's not really what you should be doing, you know? Um, so I guess that's where that's where that kind of that turning point happened for me. Well, I love the honesty and we're so glad that you were. I mean, you know, it wasn't for nothing. It needed to be a learning moment. So that is it's so great that you learned from it. I think that's super awesome. So let's take another audience question. Let's see one from CJ. When you're telling stories, do you choose the storyline that you know would do well versus the story you really want to tell? Mm, that's a good one. Uh, you know, it happens. You do both. You do both. Uh, depends really on the project. Um, my short films, I think, are kind of they're not they're not necessarily trying to be market driven so i am kind of telling the story i sort of want to tell but a lot of my decisions actually come from a sort of um practicality so a lot of it like yes there's the there's the thematic mission and there's the and and the characters you're going to follow with with the theme you're intending to explore whether it's family ties, addiction, whatever the case may be. But then there's also the practicality, which is like, what can I make that I can pull off really well? And that's what I, that's another thing I learned in my mid twenties after sort of falling on my face with this very like bloated, ambitious short I, that I, that I like elements of, but I was like, wow, there's like some good elements. And then there's some things that just don't really work because you didn't have the budget. So a lot of that actually comes from like, Yes, you study the film festival market, but you but that but the missions of the film festivals change every year. So you don't want to chase that dragon. What you want to chase is how can I be the most interesting and the most creative under the parameters of my the resources I actually have available to me. So like if your film is hinged upon a stunt that you can't really pull off, you should really pause as a filmmaker, as an aspiring artist, uh, filmmaker, pause and think about like what, uh, what about the story most interests you outside of that stunt and then see if you can do that. Because for me, it's like, uh, that's a lot of my decision process in, in making my stuff is like, as a DIY, you know, independent filmmaker, where I'm really going to be on the ground spending my own money or maybe some, uh, I raised a little bit of capital, but it's like, that. that's like, that's it. There's no, it's, it's really coming out of pocket in many ways. So then, then you start thinking like, what is going to be the most effective uh, under my, these, under my own, re with my own resources, you know? And, and that takes time to understand that and figure that out. But I kind of learned that, you know, no, audiences don't really care to watch on an indie level. No one wants to see your low budget version of like a detective, a detective noir piece with like, shootouts it might be cool in your head like the project the yeah. montage you're playing when you're listening to music let Liam Neeson do that let Hollywood do that you need to come from a personal place and so part of it's like what can I pull off what is actually speaking to me personally so those are those are the two things awesome awesome so we're going to take one more audience question. We cannot take them all. We have to be respectful of time. So our last audience question is coming from Cater It. What was the audience reactions to each of these shorts? And of those reactions, what was the most surprising to you? Well, Alte Gracia, I was actually 
disappointed it hasn't gone into, I really appreciate Soleil space because Alta Gracia got, got some love, but I feel like it, it, it was not embraced by the film festival circuit nearly enough. And mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reasons at the time, again, you know, this is like 2014, early 2015. So I love that short. And, um, you know, I understand it's very low budget and it's like, you know, maybe not the best technically or something, but I think what I was trying to depict and what I was trying to say uh, was profound. And I think the performances are really good. So it was unfortunate that Alta Gracia didn't get more eyes, more attention. Um, and then while I was gone was a hit. That was while I was gone. Every, I mean, every place venue we played at, whether it was in Texas, LA, Rhode Island, Palm Springs, it was a hit. People loved mm. it. Uh, and that's actually with that short, we convinced Roger Guinevere Smith to be, to have like a nice little guest appearance in the feature, just off the strength of that short. So that was like, when, okay, he, saw wow. that, when he saw that, he was like, all right, I'll, I'll do this for you guys, you know? So that was cool. That is very cool. And so it's so funny how that happens sometimes. Like, you know, I guess we're not in the heads of the, the film festival programmers. And it feels like some a film that may do super well in, in one year will not do well in a different year. And it just it feels I know it's not, but it does sometimes feel quite random. <laughs> but that's yeah, what Short Film Saturday is about. We're showing all the shorts, no matter all the good shorts, no matter what. I love that. And you know, I also will say about while I was gone, ironically. That was one of my more experimental shorts. And it was mm. also both experimenting in the craft and the form and the directorial form that I was going to take, which is a lot of wonders. The subjects yeah. moving close up, far away. We're not cutting. I think there's only like 16 cuts in that whole 15 minute film. So it's not like, and a lot of choreography involved. You know, I had the help of the my assistant director, Nick, Nick Rao, is one of the best in the in the film world to this day and i think i think he might be union um but he he was he's a wonderful ad but he really helped me to like kind of shape and form the the timing of the characters coming in and out frame as, as well as the yeah. dp ryan emmanuel who then i collaborated with on on the feature i'll see you around um while i was gone though it was was a one-off that we we didn't expect it to go anywhere actually because we were taking kind of in our eyes at the time, kind of big risks because it was like not a lot of cuts. It was non-actors. The script was sort of skeletal. And it was like we I believed in Lucas, but I was like, I don't know if we're going to if if the whole short is going to be able to be sustained off of your performance alone. I, I don't know. I don't know. We're going to see. Right. Because the training was limited. Right. But mm. from what I could gather, Lucas was an incredible natural talent, you know, by the time he made the feature, he was like a, pro he's a professional actor in that way, you know, because he, he really learned quick while I was gone. It was like, he was still kind of learning. One thing I think he's a, he was a stellar athlete growing up, just incredible. And I think maybe that helped mm -hmm. with the film in terms of locking in repetitive, like locking in movements re repeatedly yeah. and doing take after take. Uh, it's quite physical. Uh, people sometimes forget that filmmaking is, yeah. is quite physically physical when you actually get in the on set and on the space. It's not, you know, it, it's less thinking and more doing. Right. And um, if you're thinking too much, you're doing it wrong, I think, because <laughs> that means you didn't plan enough. So Luke was a natural in that way. And so but again, like I said, it's just funny that while I was gone, got so much uh, success because we didn't know if it was going to work and it ended up being my best short I think so it's it's funny how how life works absolutely it is very funny how that ends up happening so Daniel thank you so so much for taking the time to chat with us today we do sincerely appreciate it I want to thank the audience for sticking around and enjoying the films enjoying the Q&A and asking such wonderful questions what we have up next week is two filmmakers, Carlos Gomez Salamanca from Colombia and Richard Governor Uusu from Ghana, two filmmakers with three names. Uh, I know it's not relevant, but that's how I really like to remember it. Don't forget to like and subscribe, of course, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, everybody.